is extremely, extremely important section of this canto of the secret knowledge. Sometimes the inexpressible mystery, Sri Aurobindo capitalizes mystery. And even the dictionary tells us that it is a spiritual truth that is incomprehensible to reason and knowable only through divine revelation. How fantastic is that the dictionary caught it. And that mystery elects a human vessel of descent. So actually what happens here is that when these presences descend, these human vessels, they are sent by this inexpressible mystery. When the divine feels that there is an opportunity on earth, and we're speaking of earth now, because we're speaking of the evolutionary force. When the divine feels that there is a possibility of a progress, this involution, this human vessel of descent comes down. Notice that he just has two lines and then a full stop. A breath comes down from a supernal air. Supernal air is, air is a heavenly air. A presence is born. A guiding light awakes. Now, we have so much to talk about, but I'll continue the line until we uh, can go back to definitions. A stillness falls upon the instruments, fixed, motionless, like a marble monument, stone calm. The body is a pedestal supporting a figure of eternal peace. So powerful, so mantric. Now, we need to define presence because Sri Aurobindo uses it many, many times in savagery. And what he tells us is this, it is intended by the word presence to indicate the sense and perception of the divine as a being felt as present in one's existence and consciousness or in relation with it. Without the necessity of any further qualification or description. Thus, of ineffable presence it can only be said that it is there, and nothing more can or need be said about it. Although at the same time, one knows that all is there, personality and impersonality, power and light and ananda, and everything else and that all these flow from that indescribable presence. The word may be used sometimes in a less absolute sense, but that is always the fundamental significance, the essential perception of the essential presence supporting everything else. And this is from his letters on yoga. I'd like to go a little bit further and quote from Essays Divine and Human. 
beyond mind on spiritual and supramental levels dwells the presence, the truth, the power, the bliss that can alone deliver us from these illusions, display the light of which our ideals are tarnished disguises and impose the harmony that shall at once transfigure and reconcile all the parts of our nature. So powerful. Notice that he says beyond mind. And he says that the presence dwells on spiritual and supermental level, levels. And that can alone deliver us from the illusions, usually of our mind, our vital, whatever. And then in the life divine, he says, but if we learn to live within, we infallibly awaken to this presence within us, which is more, which is our more real self, a presence profound, calm, joyous, and puissant, of which the world is not the master, a presence which if it is not the Lord himself, is the radiation of the Lord within. He has many, many more quotes from the life divine. And perhaps we should go over a few of these. But I, what I'd like to do first go into the synthesis of yoga for one quote from, from him. For what yoga searches after is not truth of thought alone or truth of mind alone, but the dynamic truth of a living and revealing spiritual experience. There must awake in us a constant indwelling and enveloping nearness, a vivid perception, a close feeling and communion, a concrete sense and contact of a true and infinite presence, always and everywhere. That presence must remain with us as the living, pervading reality in which we and all things exist and move and act. And we must feel it always and everywhere, concrete, visible, inhabiting all things. It must be patent to us as their true self, tangible as their imperishable essence, met by us closely as their inmost spirit. To see, to feel, to sense, to contact in every way, and not merely to conceive this self and spirit here in all existences, and to feel with the same vividness all existences in this self and spirit, is the fundamental experience which must englobe all other knowledge. And I'll just end with a few brief quotes from the letters on yoga. One must have faith in the master of our life and works. Even if for a long time he conceals himself, and then in his own right time, he will reveal his presence. They, the psychic being, and the divine presence in the heart are quite different things. The psychic being is one's own individual soul being. It is not the divine, though it has come from the divine and develops towards the divine. 
And lastly, for it is quietness and inwardness that enable one to feel the presence. And we close this presence with mother's writing. For in human beings, here is a presence, the most marvelous presence on earth. And except in a very few rare cases, which I need not mention here, this presence lies asleep in the heart, not in the physical heart, but the psychic center of all beings. And when this splendor is manifested with enough purity, it will awaken in all beings the echo of his presence. All of us who have meditated or come in contact with Sri Aurobindo or Mother have felt this silence falling upon us. It is something fixed and motionless, like a marble monument. The body becomes a pedestal that is stone calm, supporting a figure of eternal peace. And now I would like to cover Sri Aurobindo's words on peace. There are not many of them, but they are so important. In the letters on yoga, he writes quite a lot. Peace is the very basis of all the city in the yoga. Peace is a more positive condition. It carries with it a sense of settled and harmonious rest and deliverance. Peace is a calm deepened into something that is very positive, amounting almost to a tranquil, waveless ananda. Peace is a deep quietude where no disturbance can come. A quietude with a sense of established security and release. In peace, there is, besides the sense of stillness, a harmony that gives a feeling of liberation and full satisfaction. Now we continue on with the lines in this powerful, powerful section. Or a revealing force sweeps blazing in out of some vast superior continent, knowledge breaks through trailing its radiant seas and nature trembles with the power, the flame. I don't know if many of you have felt this flame. I certainly did the first time I was in mother's presence. It was such an experience that I think I wept on her feet for 10 minutes afterwards, perhaps longer. Because this flame begins as a spark, as we know in the center of our being. And if we tend that spark, it will grow into a flame. And that flame will begin to rise until it envelops our entire being. Yet it never burns. There is heat, yes. And there are huge flames. 
but they do not burn. And yet, they dissolve many, many things from past lives and even present lives. Now, Sri Aurobindo takes us in another direction. He says, speaking of us, a greater personality sometimes possesses us, which yet we know is ours, or we adore the master of our souls. Here, Sri Aurobindo tells us what personality is. In the life divine, he says, impersonality is the original, undifferentiated truth of things, the pure substance of, the, of nature of the being, the person. In the dynamic truth of things, it differentiates, it differentiates its powers and lends them to constitute by their variations the manifestation of personality. I've spoken often before of Sri Aurobindo's use of capitalization in savitri. It is so important that we follow uh, these capitalized words and seek out his definitions of them. So now we come to, or we adore the master of our souls. And I'm going to probably conclude today. Well, let's see how far we can go. Sri Aurobindo speaks to us in the life divine of the master. And he says, the master and mover of our works is the one, the universal and supreme, the eternal and infinite. He is the transcendent unknown or unknowable absolute, the unexpressed and unmanifested ineffable above us. But he is also the self of all beings, the master of all worlds, transcending all worlds, the light and the guide, the all beautiful and all blissful, the beloved and the lover. He is the cosmic spirit and all creating energy around us. He is the imminent within us. All that is, is he, and he is the more than all that is. And we ourselves, though we know it not, are being of his being, force of his force, conscious with a consciousness derived from his. Even our mortal existence is made out of his substance. And there is an immortal within us that is a spark of the light and bliss that are forever. No matter whether by knowledge, works, love, or any other means to become aware of this truth of our being, to realize it, to make it effective here or elsewhere is the object of all yoga. Aware of the divine as the master of our being and action, we can learn to become channels of his shakti the divine presence, and act according to her dictates or her rule of light and power within us. Lastly, in the synthesis of yoga, 
he writes, influence is more important than example. Oh, influence is not the outward authority of the teacher over his disciple, but the power of his contact, of his presence, of the nearness of his soul to the soul of another, infusing into it, even though in silence, that which he himself is and possesses. This is the supreme sign of the master. For the greatest master is much less a teacher than a presence, pouring the divine consciousness and its constituting light and power and purity and bliss into all who are receptive around him. And we continue with the lines. Then the small bodily ego thins and falls, no more insisting on its separate self, losing the punctilio of its separate birth. It leaves us one with nature and with God. The word punctilio is just a fine point, a particular or a detail, as of conduct, ceremony, or procedure. So we lose this fine detail of our separate birth. And then it leaves us one with nature and with God. Now, you will have to tell me, because I have so many uh, classes on savagery, if I have defined, if I have read the definitions of Sri Arbindo on nature previously. I believe I may have, but not sure. Can anyone tell me? You did. Okay. Then we continue. In moments when the inner lamps are lit and the life's cherished guests are left outside, our spirit sits alone and speaks to its gulfs. Now, um, we have to continue that passage because it is so critical. A wider consciousness opens then its doors, invading from spiritual silences, a ray of the timeless glory stoops a while to commune with our seized, illumined clay and leaves its huge white stamp upon our lives. Sri Aurobindo capitalizes glory, and we know what glory is, majestic and radiant beauty and splendor, splendors. And then he speaks of communing with our seized illumined clay, well, we know what seized is, it takes possession of something by force or at will. And illumined is just giving light to, illuminate, shining on, and leaves its huge white stamp upon our lives. So we'll go back to the beginning of this passage. And Renate, could you read it for us? From um, in the moments? Uh, no, from, from in the unfolding process of the self. In 
That is page 47. 47? Yes. Ah, yeah. In the unfolding process of the self, sometimes the inexpressible mystery elects a human vessel of descent. A breath comes down from supernal air, a presence is born, a guiding light awakes, a stillness falls upon the instruments. Fixed, motionless, like a marble monument, Stone calm, the body is a pedestal, supporting a figure of eternal peace. Or a revealing force sweeps blazing in, out of some vast superior continent, knowledge breaks through, trailing its radiant seas, and nature trembles with the power of the flame. A greater personality sometimes possesses us, which yet we know is ours. Or we adore the master of our souls. Then the small bodily ego sins and falls, no more insisting on its separate self, losing the punctilio of its separate birth. It leaves us one with nature and with God. In moments when the inner lamps are lit and the life's cherished guests are left outside, our spirit sits alone and speaks to its gulfs. A wider consciousness opens then its doors, invading from spiritual silences a ray of the timeless glory stoops a while to commune with our ceased illumined clay and leaves its huge white stamp upon our lives. Well, thank you all for attending. Uh, it is so wonderful to share savagery with all of you. Uh, and thank you, Narada. Thank you, Narada. Yeah. Thank you, Narada. Yeah. Namaste.